Thank you for the uh, introduction, and uh, thank you all for having me. Um, so uh, all of the talks today have been sort of bouncing around in my head, and, and I feel like this microbiome topic has a lot of inroads to all of them. So this talk might get kind of scrambled. But uh, so I, I come here wearing sort of two hats, and I'm going to try to conduct these 10 minutes while sort of wearing both of them. The one is as a researcher uh, where I studied antibiotics and uh, antibiotic resistance from the perspective of uh, use of antibiotics in livestock and how antibiotics can pass through uh, livestock and manure and urine uh, and how that affects soil microbial processes. And the other hat is with my new role with the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative and I'll talk more about that uh, shortly. So um, with that second hat, with the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative, um, our focus is not just on the microbiome, but uh, includes the microbiome. It, it's looking at the microbiome plus all of the rest of the biological activity taking place in the soils. And uh, uh, while there are many unknowns uh, connecting soil, food, and human health, as Lily discussed leading, uh, leading up to this, uh, one, of the, um, one of the pathways we know more about is this, uh, and, and that has a strong impact, is the use of antibiotics uh, in livestock. So some of the big sort of statistics here, 80% uh, of all antibiotics used domestically are used on livestock, and this winds up being around 33 million pounds a year. Um, and because uh, a wide range of that, um, of that antibiotic that's administered to the livestock, depending on either the antibiotic used or the type of livestock, um, a wide range can be excreted into the environment intact, or at least as uh, sort of an active metabolite of antibiotic. And uh, as a result, upwards of 30 million pounds a year, so 90% of that 33 million pounds, can go into the environment and affect uh, the soil microbiome, pr uh, predominantly soil. And this is also predominantly in agricultural systems where livestock manure is used. One thing I was thinking about is this is the, by far the most times manure and uh, other sorts of excrement has been mentioned in a conference. Usually I, usually I get a lot of people sort of inching away from me when I start talking about all of the uh, manure I use. Um, but somebody else in this crowd might also be the owner of a chest freezer full of manure, uh, like, like myself. Um, so this has impacts on uh, soil, plant, and human microbiome. So this amount of antibiotics going into the soil. Um, and what we see is, and there, there are a number of different vectors by which this has been thought to uh, get into more human settings. Um, some studies have, have tried to see if it was the food itself, either the, um, in the case of manure being used as a uh, fertilizer, can be affecting uh, produce and, and other crops uh, such as those or through um, uh, livestock production, through uh, chicken and beef and pork? Is it possible that antibiotic resistance is being spread through the meat itself? Uh, other studies have tried to look at wind transportation. If you're spreading uh, manure on your fields and it's, uh, you know, maybe it doesn't rain for a few weeks and you've got some wind, is that enough to blow uh, sort of desiccated uh, bacteria into your front door and uh, all over your countertops? Uh, or into hospitals. That's, that's the, the, the main way we, we think about um, antibiotics and antibiotic-resistant pathogens. So my research is, is uh, taking a different approach. We're looking far less at uh, human health and much more at soil health and, and how soils are functioning. And it's for this reason I think livestock antibiotic use is kind of the quintessential one health problem because it affects uh, human health, it affects livestock health, but we're also finding that it affects how soils function. And while that can seem sort of intuitive, uh, antibiotics disrupt bacteria and microbial systems, uh, very few studies have looked at to see like, what the actual um, implications of that are in terms of function. And one of the things we found, so two main things, uh, antibiotics going into the system, into soil systems, essentially adds this extra thing that soil microbes have to do. They have to process soil carbon, turn over nutrients, uh, but then also deal with this incoming threat of an antibiotic. So as a result, they will have to work harder. And depending on the type of antibiotic used, we see that microbes will in fact 
uh, process more and more soil carbon uh, when exposed to antibiotics. And so this has implications for long-term sustainability and also climate change issues. Uh, the second thing we saw was uh, through a, a different study, we used a carbon and nitrogen isotope pulse chase in uh, plants and soils. And through that, we found that depending on the type of antibiotic, you can actually change how plants are moving carbon and nitrogen through the system. Um, while we didn't explicitly sample rhizospheric soil versus bulk soil, we, we suspect that this is a rhizospheric effect, that we've somehow changed the, microbe, the microbial community of the rhizosphere, and that's influenced this carbon-nitrogen trade-off between plants. And so I'd be interested in talking more about that, but I'm gonna try to pivot now into this other question. So I'm, this has all just been about microbiome. We've, we've added antibiotics, and that's affected how the microbiome is structured and how it's functioning. But that's kind of, uh, I don't know if the tip of the iceberg is the right term, but it, it, it's kind of just the, the start to the picture. And my pitch to all of you is that soil health and soil studies need to go beyond microbiome. So this is the slide I got where I can show some pretty pictures and some animations. So this is essentially the, the topic of, of our panel here. We've got the um, microbiome of the soil affecting uh, the microbiome of the food and affecting the microbiome of people and uh, people then influencing the microbiome of the soil. But if we expand this to look at a more, uh, like a fuller picture of the soil, we see that there's a lot more going on. And, um, my point in showing this isn't, uh, it is partially to uh, overwhelm with the busyness, but um, I will also emphasize that this is a simplification of what's going on uh, within soils. And to sort of, and again, this is a, to, to, be, to be purposefully complicated. That, that, that's, that's part of what I'm trying to do, so don't get bogged down in the, the connections here. My point is the microbiome is, is just the, the beginning. And it's all of this life within the soil that we depend on for a lot of uh, uh, soil function. And so my urging is, uh, while studies into the microbiome are becoming more and more accessible, um, it, we should, we should uh, be mindful of, of the bigger picture and the fact that a lot of this is contextual. Uh, for instance, we have sort of entomopathogenic nematodes that are actually fungal and bacterial farmers. They'll get into a, uh, an insect and regurgitate uh, fun fungi or bacteria, which will then break down the insect, but the, the nematode itself doesn't actually eat anything but that bacteria or fungi. So if you find that within the microbiome on its own, that means one thing, but if you find that within the microbiome within a nematode, it means something totally different. And so we should be mindful of these other processes going on. So again, soils are networks and microbiomes are part of that whole. Uh, and focusing on the microbiome alone misses out on a lot of these other um, functionally important interactions. Um, beyond that, the biodiversity of soils provides a lot of multifunctionality and resilience. And again, this is a long list, but uh, the point is that soil biodiversity and the biodiversity not just of those individual groups, but within each of those groups I showed in the last slide, um, each one of those uh, groups has numerous species within it, and we rely on that biodiversity um, for both um, multifunctionality and resilience uh, and facing challenges of climate change. So again, uh, in terms of research, I urge people to connect the microbiome to the larger biological system. But beyond that, through, this, through my role with the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative, um, we, we do know a lot about soils. And sometimes I feel like we wanna keep researching and keep digging into, um, and not that it's not important, it's very important. But we need to go beyond that and try to relay what we know to, uh, in, uh, to inform environmental policy. And the uh, GSBI uh, is, a, is a global group. Uh, we have over 1,000 participants, and uh, this group contributes to expert reviews on policy reports. Uh, we pursue soil biodiversity conservation and are, are trying to push for a global assessment of soil biodiversity. And we have ongoing work internationally with, uh, like somebody mentioned before, there's sort of an alphabet soup of acronyms up here. But, uh, 
IPBES uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, a number of UN affiliates. Uh, we do far less work domestically. I think a lot of this work is sort of looked past uh, domestically, but um, we're trying to, for now, at least have an impact internationally. And um, a lot of the support for this comes from partnerships uh, with scientists around the world, like I mentioned earlier, and uh, um, with a lot of these uh, international groups, as well as with the uh, scientific community. Uh, so I took sort of an alternative approach to this concluding slide than, than the rest of it, primarily because the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative focuses more on trying to inform policy than, um, than pushing a, a research agenda. So my big take home is you know, get engaged on, uh, on more environmental uh, policy action. And thanks for having me.